Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Law of Relevancy podcast. I'm your host, Cord Zoen. I'm the president and CEO of Bake More Pies, a full service advertising and marketing agency here in Tampa Bay. On this show, we talk about things that are happening right now. Sometimes we dig a little bit into the past because we need to understand the context. But what we really like to focus on is information that can help people right now with their careers. We like to focus on marketing, communications, and that whole industry. Today, I'm joined by Lou Zant. Hey, buddy. So, Good Lou, yeah, thank you so much for coming on the show, flying all the way out here from California. Yeah. Lou is a serial entrepreneur, and he's got quite a story to tell. He's got what an interesting background, been involved in many, many successful ventures. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about your most recent one as well. I like that. I like talking about it. I mean, yeah. I really do. It's kind of my passion, you know. Yeah, for sure. So, so Lou, you've got, uh, so I, I met you not long ago, actually. Yeah, a few uh, weeks ago. Yep. And, uh, and I'm excited about your latest project. But you've got quite a background. Could you give us the, a little bit of information about what you've um, accomplished in your career? Well, it's been a crazy career. I, you know, I, <clears throat> I shared with you a little bit earlier that I, I've always believed that my one knack in life is to figure out things that don't fit, how to make them fit. And I was that guy, you know, growing up, had dyslexia really bad and they didn't know what dyslexia was when I was a kid. They just, you know, they called me a slow learner or what. And it was humiliating during spelling bees. You know, you had to go up to the front of the class and spell a word. If you didn't, yeah. you had to go sit down. <clears throat> so a little bit of a class clown came out of that. And, but uh, learned how to sink a basketball and throw a football. And that kind of helped me uh, make it through the rest of school. Um, and I didn't realize it, but I kind of always had to think how to fit in or, you know, how I could fit or how anything could fit together. And so when I got out of playing sports, you know, I'd been playing at a pretty high level for nine years for all through high school and all through college. And I had a pretty weird shape and um, I'd gotten out of Ole Miss and went out to stay with my sister for a while because her husband was going over to Okinawa for the Marines. And started going to club, you know, things that, that were starting to evolve back then. This was in the 70s, the late 70s. And um, we would, you know, there was like these real hip clubs and people were wearing jeans. And I just couldn't find a pair of jeans to fit. And I went down to Grant Boys. There was probably 3,000 pair and I'm trying them on. And I said, this is great. I'm only, I was 6'4", 220 pounds. Probably in those days had a little smaller waist than I do now, and uh, small waist, big butt and thighs, and and so I found a lady that made custom jeans, and I'd show up at because this, there wasn't any that fit you at the other no. store, and she sewed old denim together. They were patches, and people loved them, and they said, "Where'd you get them?" I said, "Well, go see this, go see her, go see." Her. And one day I just went to her and I said, "Hey, you make them and I'll sell them." And so I went down to Grant Boys, and I go, give me her, her, and her. I could tell it was in those days, which are a lot different today, there was a size 2, a size 4, and a size 6. And I asked them to go in the dressing room and try them on, and they walked out, and they went, oh, man, these are awesome. And, in, and these were the times when, like, there was a joke where you'd lay on the bed with a pair of pliers to try to zip them up, tight jeans. Were, right, I remember you know, those. Yeah, you know, that was like the thing. <laughs> And, um, and sure enough, I, I had, I built this confidence. I could go into any store and just ask a couple of the, the people working on the floor to try the jeans on. And when they walked out, they loved them. And so I would throw a half a dozen pair in my car and take off from Orange County. We were in Newport beach and sometimes like I'd end up in Atlanta, Georgia, you know, I did, I'd been all over the South and I, I remember at the end of the day, I'd take all the orders and they were like these three form uh, carbon paper Yeah, and it filled the envelope as thick as it would. And I'd try to get as much as I could off of one stamp and right. I'd mail them back. Mm -hmm. I'd mail the orders back. And, um, you know, we ended up going to about 900 million a year in sales. It became the second largest gene company in the world. And I, I was being romanced and ended up selling it to the largest gene company in the world, which was Levi. And then, 
I, I noticed just how much I missed the business and I didn't fit into corporate America at all. Mm-hmm. And I love the clothing business. And I thought, you know, I really want to start dressing different. I want to wear nicer clothes. And so I took a trip out to New York to go to the Men's Apparel Guild show. <clears throat> Had a really good buddy there named Baker Cole. And Baker was trying to start a real cool shoe line that was like loafers with crepe soles and Kelties and tassels. And um, he couldn't afford a show, a, a booth. And another unknown designer was in the room with him, and he couldn't afford it. But together, they could get this room at the Berkshire place for the designer collective, and buyers would walk. They'd have to get up at 5, get the maids to clean the rooms, and then they'd set up their displays. And buyers would walk down the hall and look into the room. And if they liked what they see, they'd go in. So I met him after the first day. We were going to go out and party. And I'm kind of there in the room, and I'm going, dude, I really like this look. I want some of this. I go, you know, your look with a pair of jeans and some of Baker's shoes, this would go phenomenal. And uh, I said, I could sell this. And we started talking. We partied. The next day I went back. I go, no, 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 really, I want to. And, you know, Baker's, his dad was the Cole of Kohan. And the, and Kohan was a very British brogam, mm-hmm. you know, big shoe. And um, so I knew there was a, he, they were going to be quality and I knew they would make it. And so I cut a deal with this designer, and I got 8% commission for five years on all of North America. And I, for that, I would set up the uh, sales force and that under one condition. I would be the fit bottle for extra large. And he agreed. And his name was Calvin Klein, and he ended up doing really well. I've heard and of him. Yeah, the, the clothes started checking at, at retail, and... <laughs> It was a great ride. And then one day the whole clothing industry went to pot with consolidation, which is a little bit what I'm worried about in the wine business right now, that consolidation. So I went on and new ventures, started a couple other projects over the years. And yeah, it's been fun. I did direct sales. I did alternative medicine in the 90s. I hit technology hard, pioneered a lot of speech rec because of being a dyslexic. I knew that was the future for guys like us that had trouble. And, uh, yeah. So, Lou, you're, you're one of the unicorns that actually looks like you were able to pull off sales and marketing executive roles. How, did, how in the world did you do that? I guess I was a unicorn because I never really, Cordis, I never noticed the difference. You know, to me, we had a job. That was to, if we believed in our product, which fortunately being an entrepreneur, you kind of love, you, that starts you you know, your love for that product. And then you got to figure out how to bring it to the masses. You know, one of my mentors early in life said, buddy, sell to the masses and live with the classes. That's why everybody freaked out. All my friends freaked out when I went from blue jeans to designer clothes. But I said, I got a feeling that designer clothes are going to be popular. And um, so if, you know, when you're passionate about it, all it is is developing your story, that story. And when you have that story down for the pitch of, of your product and it's right, you'll close 95% of the yeah. people. You know, it takes, a, you got to play with it a lot. But when you get it down, it's 95%. So yeah. that's the marketing, I guess, right? And then, you know, we, your concept of marketing is way different because you've got this gift of how to do video and how to do print and all of that you know mine was face to face telling the story you know and and replicate and duplicating that like i'd find people i'd i'd duplicate myself into that person and then have them do it you know yeah absolutely looking for that way that way you can connect with them and help communicate with them about about your story so let's talk about stories for a second so okay your latest venture is a wine company. Right. Major Crush. That's right. Yeah. Um, by the way, <clears throat> my mentor taught me the facts tells, but the story sells. So you can work about facts all day long, but until you get your story, it's not going to sell. You know, so you have to create the story. And the story, you know, th- that's what Major Crush is about. Like, I've had a major crush on wine since the 80s. Um, and there's so much 
in the winemaking business is about crush. Yeah. You know, you pick the grapes, then you crush them. It's a great name. To extract the juice and, and all that. And um, a, a good, our, our real close friends up in Sonoma, um, Meredith and I were going through all of our WSET levels. You know, it's this uh, Wine and Spirits Education Trust. It's different than a sommelier guild, the sommelier guild, because it's not about being a sommelier at a restaurant or building a wine list. It's about educated education. And it's, you know, you get up into those levels, it's tough. It's really brutal. And so you're studying all the time and you're listening to whatever you can get your ears on. And so it so happened, Meredith and I worked out at the same gym. We were there one morning and I said, hey, listen, before I jump on the, on the elliptic machine, do you have, is there a good podcast or, or anything I could listen to while I'm doing my workout? She goes, mm-hmm. I know, right? There, I, I don't know where any of them are. And so about halfway through my workout, I got off the machine, went back where she was working out, and I said, let's start one. She goes, why not? Yes, <laughs> I think that's what she right? said, why not? She goes, when? I go, tomorrow. And she, you know, that's how I am. I mean, if, if it's a good idea, let's go. And uh, got my wife, and we got a, a, a software called Anchor. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we hooked up our cell phones in this crummy mic. I mean, we ordered it off of Amazon. I yeah, of course. 29 or $39. It was this box. Well, and, tech uh, can always be upgraded later. Oh, God, it was brutal, brother. The yeah. quality was just horrible. And next thing you know, we're, we're trending. And, you know, they said we're the number one podcast on one of the deal, on one of Spotify or something like that in the category. And so Sonia called him and asked, what, what's the deal? He goes, well, you guys are in the hottest... Uh, sector for podcasts so it wasn't about us obviously it was we were in a good section but we kept growing and we were having a lot of fun and all we would do is go in and tell the story of a good you know like I know these guys I, I'm a consultant to about 200 wineries and I know these winemakers they're such great guys and they're artists you know yeah. we we were talking about uh, culinary school and that I mean the creation that what these guys can put together in a glass is amazing when you've had bad wine. Well, let's talk about some of the, the challenges the wine industry has faced. I mean, you mentioned earlier about consolidation. There's a yeah. lot of industries that we work in. There's the radio industry had consolidation. It almost never goes, like, <laughs> never, it almost never makes it better, it, right? It never does. <clears throat> Maybe yeah. for the shareholders only. But, but uh, what's happening in, in the wine industry and why is there a need for this direct consumer model, so to speak, or this club for, um, for these vineyards? Well, I, I, I got, I read some unbelievable statistics, Mm -hmm. uh, in the, uh, every year Silicon Valley bank comes out with a report. Yeah. And we went, we went into it deep last year and I pre COVID, I, I was telling Meredith and Sonia and the team, I go, guys, this model isn't going to work. It isn't working. It's the same model that wineries have been doing for 25 years. Yeah. You know, you got to get on a plane from Tampa, Florida. You got to fly to San Francisco, Sacramento, or Oakland. You got to uh, shuttle up to the wine country, stay in a very expensive hotel, hire a driver, go around to the various wineries, pay 25 to $75 per person per tasting. And if you like a couple of their wines, you join their wine club. And, you, and the average is 28 months. People get up because they're tired of those same wines. Right. And I go, guys, they can't do it. Well, COVID hits, and sure enough, now they don't. What are they going to do? Nobody was coming to the wine country. Right. And they couldn't open. They have no distribution at that yeah, point. Yeah, so they start playing around with virtual and that, and they're doing a horrible job. Even myself. Meredith and I did some, and it was terrible. Well, um, I started thinking, we're growing. We need some sponsors. But all those guys that I'd listened to and studied when I was studying, they need a place. They need a platform. Right. And we've interviewed John Ash, who's the father of wine country cuisine. And, you know, we've interviewed Greg Brewer from Brewer Clifton. And that year he wins winemaker of the year in the United States. And my girlfriend, Lane Tanner, down in uh, in, in, uh, Santa Rita, Um, all these incredible people that are so rich in stories, you know, let's, let's create a community platform slash app for right. everybody. 
And so we're developing that. And then I, I saw some staggering statistics to support what I was feeling in my gut. It wasn't fitting. I had to find the fit. And so I'm looking at this thing, and there's about 10,000, 30 wineries on the west coast of the United States. Out of that 10,000, only 3% of those wineries, you will ever see their wines at a retail sh uh, shelf. Why is that? Well, you think about it, Cordes. If you're going to open up a public <coughs> Safeway, Kroger, uh, Total Wine and that, think about the level of production you have to have. Yeah, you've got to be able to supply it. You know, the, the wines that we do in Major Crush Club, they make 150 cases of that bottle. Right. If you're going to sell the Safeway, you're going to need 10,000 cases for a store. So now, you're, now your production's three, four, five hundred thousand 500,000 cases. Well, guess what happens to the artisanship? It's out the... We got machines now. Yeah, you're <laughs> Let's order to, the machines. You, 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 you've gone to the cafeteria, brother. <laughs> you know, I know. You've gone to a, a huge yeah. convention where they're serving you chicken mm. or yeah. cold chicken or cold roast beef. And, uh, and right. that's what happens. And what's even more shocking about consolidation <clears throat> is three out of four wines sold at retail today is, are one company. Yeah. Gallo. So when you walk down the aisle at your Publix or Safeway and you see four or 500 labels, 350 of them are Gallo. They're just different labels that they produce. Right. So it's better living through chemistry. These, these formulas to get a taste of a popular wine are done in the lab. It's not done by a winemaker. And the more you get exposed to artisan wines, the less you like mass-produced wines. Yeah, I can imagine that. I mean, what's the... Uh, so it's almost like your club is, is turning wine drinkers into wine lovers. Well, that's <laughs> what we're, we're, our, our little um, tagline is taking people from wine curious to wine informed. And I believe, you know, you and I were laughing about it earlier, how true it is back in the day and for you today, you got friends coming over for a nice dinner. You got to go out and get a bottle of wine. Gosh darn it. You just grab a bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon. What's safe? Right. Just grab whatever. Because I know what that's sort of tastes like. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, really my main criteria is the cost. Yeah. And right? if it's an expensive bottle, right. it must be good. <clears throat> I'm trying to stick around, you know, 20, 25 bo dollars a bottle. You know, yep. that's like an appropriate amount. Yeah. It's tough. I was talking to the one of the girls that works here earlier, and she goes, golly, I found myself during COVID and shelter in place having a glass of wine every night. I've really fallen in love with wine. I go, what's your favorite varietal? She was really embarrassed. And she goes, I hate to say that, but it's Merlot. And I said, did you know that's the most expensive grape in the world? She goes, no. Yeah. I said, yeah, a bottle of Petrus from the West Bank of Bordeaux when it's released, it's $3,000. It's one of the most expensive bottles in the world. It's 100% Merlot grape. So I go, don't be embarrassed. You, what happened is the, the movie Sideways. That was the movie. Yeah, right. It gave it, it a bad name. It. it gave it a bad name. You know, two weeks, like I say, two weeks before Sideways, a bottle of Pinot was $40 and a bottle of Merlot was 10 I mean, a bottle of, of Merlot was 40 and a bottle of Pinot was 10 Two weeks after that movie, a bottle of Pinot went to 40 and a Merlot went to 10. It killed the Merlot grape. It killed it. And what's happening now, we have a big trend I'm noticing the last couple of years that, that people are coming and they're craving the Cab Francs and the Bordeaux blends where the, the softer, more floral style of, of red mm -hmm. versus this big, jammy, tannic, spicy Cab that everybody started uh, going towards in the valley. And most people are burnt out. Now, tomorrow night, we're going to have a big, jammy, phenomenal cab. <laughs> and I love that. But not all the time, you know? Yeah. You can really get burned out on it. And uh, so what we try to do, and one of the, the reason we started the Crush Collection is our number one comment was, Dad, come at you guys. When you're over there talking to... Yeah. <laughs> whoever about the wines, I'm drooling. You're killing me. Where do I get that wine? And of course, there's no way to get it. It's really S difficult. Yeah, so there, we're picking right? four that we're crushing on every month. And they're, 
it's pretty close to a couple hundred fifty to two hundred dollars worth of wine for eighty nine dollars, and deliver it to your door. And what Meredith and I do, we go into in depth uh, video on our tasting notes. Like we go deep into it, like we had to do for our level three exam. Sure. You know, um, and uh, and so we share that with you, and then we do. Uh, other tasting notes and then we have a real fun time meredith is this she 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 will never admit it but she's a phenomenal cook and because she loves wine she's pretty good really good at pairing so we have a video called pair with mare nice and it's not your average stuff like she, and she eats real healthy so they do a she does a mare version and a loo version you know i do the naughty and she does the nice nice and it seems like that's a big trend these days the yeah. healthy yeah i gotta get more over to the mare side uh, <laughs> when i get home <laughs> it's all starting to pile up on me yeah. so how do you like this wine we're sipping now that's it's delicious it, it is good it's fantastic it's a white blend uh, the varietals are uh, Sauvignon Blanc, Viognier, Gewurztraminer, and Pinot Grigio. Yeah, it's it's really balanced. It's not too sweet. Yeah, and you're a Gewurz fan. Yeah, I I was at one time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I I would say my favorite white right now is Sauvignon Blanc. I really like a good Sauvignon Blanc. Citrus is just good. It's really good. A lot of different kinds. New Zealand has the grassy kind of herbaceous type of Sauv Blanc and all of the valley. You, you go anywhere in the valley, pretty much they'll greet you at the parking lot with a glass of Sauv Blanc. So help us understand. I mean, I under from what I from what I know about the history of wines, and I'm not even close to being uh, a, a really even a connoisseur of wine. Like I like to drink it at gatherings and things like that. But California really wasn't always highly regarded. Not really until 1976. I mean, it was it was not even regarded. Yeah. And what happened is there was this, a guy from England, a Brit, opened up a wine store in Paris, Yeah. which was really bizarre. But he had an unbelievable palate, and he was always being asked to be a judge. Right. And he goes, we need more judges. So he ended up actually opening up a sommelier school. Well, these kids were coming over from California to attend a sommelier school in Paris like they would at Cardon Bleu or to learn cooking. And and they kept coming up to him and going, you know, these, our California wines are as good as these. Right. He said, you got to be kidding me. So his, his name was Steve Spurrier. He flies to San Francisco, goes up into the wine country, and we like to blame him. He was the first one to ever pay for a tasting. Because in those days, you you pulled up to the barn or you know where the winery was, right. and and the winemaker would come out and meet you, and there'd be a jug somewhere, and he'd pour out of the jug and pour you a glass, and he's tasting this wine, he's going, oh my gosh, so he takes eleven whites and eleven reds, and he flies back over to Paris, and he puts on a blind tasting, yeah, and he has the top chefs, the top sommeliers, the top wine writers. And they do a blind tasting of California versus France. And an $8.80 bottle of Chateau Montalena beat out a $440 bottle of Betrus Montrachet. A three-year-old, which is unheard of. The vines were three years old on, on, um, silver, on uh, Stag's Leap. That beats out the top Bordeaux, Chateau Lafitte. And... California swept it, and it was funny. It's funny to watch the videos of it because they'd be on, they'd sip, and they go, "Oh, that's, that's so." There's videos we can watch of this. There, yeah, there's a movie called Bottle Shock, but it's not. It's kind of a more of a play on it. They're coming out with the documentary. It's called The Judgment of Paris, 1976. So Silver Oak and Chateau Montalena wins, right? Well, the the guy from Time Magazine releases it, and the wine writers. The next thing you know. These poor wineries are getting blown up by every wine store in the country, and California wines were on the map. Never be the same ever. Never again. been the same. You know, Ridge and and I could I could list them. Who won the best Zinfandel? Who won the best um, Merlot? Who who won the best? Uh, my my real close friend Ron Fanolio, who's the Jacuzzi family, his uh, Chardonnay won the most French like 
and it was from Mount Veter. It was off of uh, Mount Veter there in Napa, where the grapes came from. But it, it, it seems like it kind of logically makes sense, though. I mean, isn't it the ideal climate? It really is. You know, my, it is more of an ideal than, than it, say, Bordeaux, because Bordeaux right. has violent fall. You know, this is why they have to pick the grapes so early, because it's sort of that's the nature of that area of France. Very violent storms, hail and all that, come in the fall. So the reason that French wines might be softer, lighter in flavor, not the deep uh, jammy, is because they, they pick them at like 21 to 23 bricks. Bricks is the sugar measurement in a, in a BRIX in a wine. Man, in September, October, it gets up to 105, 108 degrees in the valley, 115 in Calistoga some days, Cool, cool nights, 50-degree nights, so they're maintaining. But that sun is driving the sugar in those grapes sure. up, and they shut the water off halfway through the season. So they're stressed, the skins are tight, the juice is just sweet and big. They're picking them at 32, 36 bricks. And so you drink a California red, and it's jammy and sweet, high alcohol, because the sugar converts right. to alcohol. So you see 14.8, 15.4, whereas pretty much everything coming out of Bordeaux is around 13.6, 13.8. But it's beautiful, you know? I yeah, love well, Bordeaux. that's part of the variety, right? Yeah, it's the variety. So you still get the difference. So being a sales and marketing guy, you recognize that there was potentially a need for this club that would give access because really you're talking about two hundred dollars worth of wine, but that's if you bought it at, like if, at a retail store. At a retail store, like you were there, if you could find these, right? So like you would have to be in Sonoma, yeah, to find this for two hundred dollars. Pretty so, much at the winery, right? But so if I wanted to get it without a club, I would have to order from this one, pay for the bottle and shipping and handling, right? And then this one, so it's really more like four hundred dollars if I wanted to order that's it direct. Kind of true, and it, you still deliver a virtual experience through your yeah. podcast every yeah. month, right? So I'm, you're saving me really like thousands of dollars. Yeah, we, we did a deal on it. Was $551 <clears throat> for the retail value of a case of our yeah. wine, and we sell it for 267 shipped. Yeah. That's including shipping. Oops. And you're keeping this craft going yeah. from the, for the small people that actually care about That's the what quality. I love. Of what's going in the bottle. That's what really I love. I mean, I got guys that I'd call them and say, hey, Michael, put, put a mixed case together for me, will you? Yeah, I don't even care. Just do your thing. I love every, I love every, <laughs> right. and he goes, okay, Lou, it'll be on the porch. I mean, he yeah. doesn't have a winery. He doesn't have a yeah. tasting room. I'd drive up, it'd be on the porch. I'd figure out a way to pay him, you know, and yeah. be off to the races. These guys, the the guy, Peter Mathis, we're, we're going to come out with his wine for the, for the summer arguably the best rosé I've ever had, so from 100% Grenache. And uh, he's got three acres, biodynamic, the purest farming you could do. But nobody knows it in, in I think it was 2011, he won what wine maker. What is biodynamic? I'm Biodynamics, sorry. brother, is, is the 10th degree organic. Sounds it, very relevant. Yeah, it was like developed. I should know what that means. Developed by the guy who invented Montessori. And... Basically, you know, the, the rule is you have to plant the vines with the, with the moon cycles. Uh, whatever acre you have under vine, you have to have the same amount of acre under indigenous growth and the same amount of acreage under fruits and vegetables. You have to have wild animals roaming. And you'll notice on a biodynamic vineyard, a lot of different shaped birdhouses. Now, my vineyard's organic, and, and it's, I have different shaped birdhouses for that reason, because you want to attract specific birds that eat specific insects. Oh, right. But they go a step further. They take cow's horns, not bulls, cow's horns, hollow them out, and they stuff them with manure and a type of crystal, and they bury it for anywhere from six months to a year. They dig it up, they empty the, the horns into a tote of water, and they make a tea. And they go and spray the vines, and it creates a natural pheromone that repels dangerous insects. And it increases uh, photosynthesis. How like, did they figure that out? Who knows? I don't know. 
Uh, Sounds like witchcraft. Yeah, I think it is. But and then fifty halfway through the growth, they have to drop fifty percent of the grapes so that the remaining all the energy in the vines for the last half of the season goes into that level of grapes. So it's fabulous. How much does a bottle of wine cost from that vineyard? Um, we 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 pretty much have at least one biodynamic wine in every one of our shipments. Oh my gosh. Most of France is almost almost all of France has gone biodynamic. Oh, so this is a thing. Yeah, Italy's on its way. We have we I remember two years ago we had fifty one vineyards up there and I bet you we have hundred and fifty now that have gone. And um, it's just a, a real cool, balanced way of, of growing. And it's hard to get a certificate for organic because, you know, you can do everything to the letter, but the but the soap that I wash my tanks out with right. might not qualify under the organic list. I can't get the I can't get the certification. Well, it does seem like there's you know I think I think there are some some parallels in some of the other industries, you know, like, so it's, it seems like even with the organic designation, it seems like there's a lot of people out there that have, are doing things to sort of game the system to get the organic piece. Right. Yeah. But it sounds like this biodynamic, I mean, if we can create a, some kind of a way to control insects, right. That might use something that may not, Make me kick you out of the organic or whatever. That's not necessarily a bad thing. No, it's really it's a great thing. And then, right. you know, the birds are helping. You have hawks and owls that will right. take care of the critters. Right. And it's really a beautiful. And, I mean, the, the things that grow on a, you know, Devero is a perfect example. Ridgely's the guy that founded um, QuickBooks and sold out, chucked everything and moved up to the wine country. He's got the most beautiful biodynamic vineyard we did a podcast with him on major crush it's great to listen to and it you know butterflies everywhere bees everywhere things you don't see you mean when you, when you and i grew up when you grew up in georgia if you walked around in the in the woods in the in the gardens there were butterflies and bees tons of them you don't see them anymore you know except on these beautiful biodynamic farms and um, so I'm a, I'm a big advocate of it. I, I, I hope it, it continues to grow, and I think it will. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I can't drink wine. I get splitting headaches or, and that I'm allergic to sulfites. Right. Tell me about that. It's not sulfites, brother. There's, there's, less, there, there's more sulfites in a half a teaspoon of peanut butter than a bottle of wine, and they're natural sulfites. The thing that's causing the headaches is a combination of Roundup, it's a negative effect of the of the spray they use. Really, on the grapes, yeah, and a and a thing called residual sugar. If they're not, you know, <clears throat> in school, one of my instructors said the best fertilizer for a vineyard is the footsteps of the winemaker. And if that if a winemaker's not paying a lot of attention all the time during growing season, sure, you're not going to come out with the premier grape. Well, you go down into the Central Valley and drive down 101, you you go for miles of rows of vines. And you see planes flying over them, dropping right. stuff. And you see gigantic tractors picking them. And they go into massive tanks. And they're produced in a lab to put it out. I mean... And that's what's at the grocery store. That's at the grocery store. Right. And they put mega purple in to get it more, a better color to look like a, a high-end wine. I mean, the, the Gallo factory um, down in um, uh, south of San Jose, they have a turnaround driveway. And the, the, the trucks are lined up. They drop off a million gallons of juice a day. At any given time, that plant has 100 million gallons of, of grape juice. So where's how the, could you, how where's could you the really, artisanship? Yeah, there's not. And, and I would assume that the reason that those wine clubs exist at the vineyards is because people who visit the region understand that there's a difference in the quality. Oh, they go back in the barrel room and you do a, a, you thief some right. wine out of the barrel and you go, oh, okay, you get it. You know, you just, you just know it's so cool. That's great. So you've you've recognized quite a few opportunities in your career. How strongly do you feel about this one? Well, 
I, I didn't know this either, but wine is the most consumed liquid in America. More than any other soda pop or anything like that. And I do believe 99 out of 100 people that you'll run into on the streets are a lot, they'll say exactly what you said earlier in the podcast, what I said before I started taking it on. I'll probably buy a cab. Yeah. I don't know, you know. I've never had a Grenache. I've never right. had a Maved. It sounds risky. Like, I don't know if I want to go there. Yeah. <laughs> and by know? the way, if you're buying it at Publix, it's probably risky, you know. Yeah. Um, but this <clears throat> world, obviously, you know, why the first thing God told Noah to do when he got off the ark is plant your vines. You know, it's been a big part because yeah. the, the, the juice represents blood in, in Christianity. It's there it's thousands just, of times. Yeah. Right. And, and you know, it's really cool when you study how the Rhone Valley was was discovered. And, you know, it was called the highway from hell because the Roman soldiers would come up that way. Mm -hmm. And um, the the Pope had a summer home uh, in Rhone, and a war hero ended up buying it. And he, he goes, what's going on here? You got Cote Rote with the greatest Syrah I've ever tasted. And then you go down to Hermitage in central Rhone, and you have these these Grenaches that are just bright and beautiful acid. And then you go down and you got Maved, which is looks like it's spelled Mavedra. And he goes, gosh, and, and, and you have these other beautiful Marsan, Roussan, Viognier's. I'm going to have to blend them. And they go, oh, what? You're going to blend wine? And he put together Chateauneuf du Pop, which is the castle of the Pope, named it after his deal. And I mean, it's one of the most famous wines in the world. Some pope was in, some monk was in the woods in Bourgogne, in Bourguignon and saw this weird grape that had a real tight cluster to it, went back and juiced it, and it was Pinot Noir. Yeah. And he discovered Pinot Noir, you know. Um, Pinot Grigio, it migrated from Hungary. It was a Tolkai grape, became a noble grape in Hungary, migrated to Austria, became a noble grape in Austria, went to Alsace. Then in France, it became a noble grape, and they called it Pinot Gris. And in, in Italy, it became a noble grape and called it Pinot Grigio. I mean, if this grape's made it that far, it's a pretty daggum good grape. Right. You well, know? I think what you're talking about is you've recognized that there's this industry in this world of, of wine that's basically been with us for thousands of years as humanity, yeah. right? And so... It seems like you've identified there's like this need for innovation. Yeah, and, and if you think about it really, and I, I almost think this is one of the mandates of God, and, and you know, church is about assembly, community in a, in, a, in a good sense. Wine creates community. That's one of the things we've really discovered at Major Crush. And you'll hear us refer to it a lot. Um, and that's, that's where we want to eventually evolve where we create, you know, call it an app, but it's going to be beyond an app. It'll be a platform for community. And what helps you is, like anything, is to learn more about it. Sure. So we're, you're learning on the podcast. You're learning on the Tasty Notes. Let's say now you all of a sudden start liking Pinot Noir. We got to know why. You know, why do I like this so much? So you'll be able to go on the platform and go into a room, a hangout on Pinot. And yeah. there'll be uh, my boy Ephraim Glago from Wrestler, and he'll be talking about his Pinots. And Pinot Noir is so hip because for some reason I'm a Pinot Savant, and I, I can even now identify the clone that the, the grape came out. So, you know, I was over at Wrestler, and, and they put five wines out in front of me, and I nailed them. I go, this one's Green Valley, Sonoma Coast. This one's Carneros, this one's Santa Lucia Highlands, this one's Santa Rita. And you taste these and you know, because they've got either strawberry on velvet or they've got this beautiful dirt soil coming through and all these features. And uh, and it now, Pinot is a whole new world. Like this bottle that I brought for tomorrow night, you, you're going to freak out. You know, it's Yeah, I'm excited. Just, it's, um, so you're obviously, I mean... Anybody listening to this podcast, I'm sure will agree that you sound like a wine expert. You have the certificate. Yeah, you are a wine I, I expert, got the right? Certificate, yeah. So, 
how, like, what advice would you give to people that are listening to this about, it's it, like, you know, we were talking earlier, and I'd like for you to share with people, like, how you got into wine. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's, it's like you took you this, um, this uh, kind of a hobby that seemed to, like, get warmed up over time, and you got more interested in it, more interested in it, got really into the region out there in, in Sonoma, and... And you've immersed yourself, and you're just a natural at understanding there's some sort of an arbitrage or an, or, or an opportunity where there's not a fit, and you've identified it. What, what advice would you give to others about if they're looking to get into, maybe change their lives, change their careers? You're an expert. You're very skilled at this. How important is that when, when in their ventures? Well... My biggest recommendation to somebody that is frustrated with where they're at with wine, yeah, and I, I hate to toot my own horn, but I, this is the reason that Meredith and I put this whole concept together. Yeah. You can't do a better thing than join than just join this club. Yeah, look forward to every month getting them and having your friends over and taking a bottle and before you open it, watch our video on this particular. Uh, bottle and what's in it do a taste with your friends and stuff boom community right and you would never in your life go and buy a Saint Blanc, a Verts Demeanor, Viognier's a Pinot Grigio blend right you know what what about Zinfandel Zinfandel is my favorite grape yeah you know they call me Lou Zin instead of Lou Zan. Um, but intimidation has been big, you know, oh, Chateau Neuf du Dudu, and, you know, this is not a chateau, and this is this. But if you really are in the wine country, they're yeah. the most real people. And I love sitting at the feet of the old guys. And they would talk about the days, you know, like it was all community. Hey, Cordis, I'm, I'm, it's, you know, two in the morning. I'm almost done with barreling up. I need one more barrel. You got a barrel? Yeah, Lou, go grab it. And then, you know, later on, you know, I'm I'm spraying, I'm I'm, I'm out there putting the um, the soil tilt. I go, you want me to hit that back uh, acre vineyard you got over there? Yeah, and, and then, by the way, have you been down and tasted Cordis wine? Hey, have you tried Lou's yeah. wine? And it was just this beautiful community. The story is rich. <laughs> it's really rich. And now, you know, who is... Constellation Brands, who is Foley, who is Di- Diageo, you know? And it's like the person in the tasting room that's been hired to, to offer these tastings, so they need to look important. And now they're acting important, and they're intimidating you. You know, it shouldn't right. be that way. Yeah, it should be way more authentic. And I think, I think you come across that way. Right, and the stories and the old guys, like you're mentioning, it, it is truly authentic. Yeah. I mean, look at how how young kids today learn beer. I mean, my sons can tell you hops, where the hops came from India, and, you know, there's a Pilsner and an IPA. They're like sommeliers for beer. That's right, yeah. You know, because they're interested in it. And, and with our Blank Wine Club with Josh and Lars, that's who it's designed for. This is one of their, we put the blank label on Tell this. me about that, because I, th- I think that's really relevant, right? So what's going on with Gen Z? Well, it's, I'll tell you what, they, for the first the time, they've taken wine. over baby boomers in buying. <clears throat> really? Yeah. So millennials buy more wine. More wine and pay more per bottle, and two-thirds of them are women. Kind of interesting. But one of the things that they struggle with, and they did this with beer, they want to know why this they like or don't like a particular beer. Sure. Why do I like an IPA over a Pilsner, and why don't I like an IPA over a Pilsner? So what's been confusing, the only real exposure they've had to wine is mom and dad. And what Josh and Lars are saying is, hey, that chateau on the bottle of mom and dad's wine is about 30 years old. It's not 300 years old. You know, it was this brand. It got popular. This is what they buy at Best Buy or, I mean, at, at Total Wine or, and that. And so they embrace the, the theory of taking people from wine curious to wine informed in another way. And every single day when you're in, in studying for your 
certificates, you have to identify four things. What is the acid? Meaning, you know, is there fruit? Is the fruit bright? The pH is what it is. You have to um, go deep into color. And I go, God, big, hey, it's yellow. You know, no, it's not yellow. It's light yellow. It's gold. It's whatever. Because the color is telling a, sure. s- a story. The third thing is the texture. You put. I always put the first couple of sips on my tongue, lay it evenly, and I close my eyes and I'm thinking, all right, where do I feel this? Is it thin? Is it got good texture? Then when I swallow it, does it change on the back of my palate? Then that secondary olfactory breath you take will start giving you massive information. And the fourth one is, what are you tasting? So if I say blackberry, what about black fruit? So the blackberry, the black fruit category could be blackberries, um, black currant, plum, um, several black fruits. And so then you kind of start going into it. And people are intimidated with that. Because when I poured this for you, I said I taste pineapple and green sure. apple and stuff. Granted, you're probably going to taste that too. It's the power of suggestion. Right. You know? we, had a, we had a field blend last month. And I'm, t- I'm going, what am I tasting? And, and Josh goes, I'm tasting the pie crust of a blackberry pie. I went, <laughs> that's it. That's exactly what it was, you know. That's and, funny. And so what I do tell people is the next time you eat a strawberry, don't eat it. Like, yeah. think about it. Put it in. Because we have all that huge memory bank yeah. of what a strawberry, raspberry, blackberry tasted right. like. Or a particular, you know, some of them taste smells and taste like barn floors. Um, Isn't that called oak? But you, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's an age and, right. and cork, corkiness. Exactly. Um, but it brings that it, you you start bringing all that stuff up to the forefront, and it's so much fun to open yeah. a bottle with friends and play the game, yeah. you know. And we offer we 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 put a wheel in um, our our wines that have all the categories. Yeah. So you can look down and say, ooh, is it red fruit or black fruit that I'm tasting? You know, is it a white peach or a yellow peach? No, it's a great community. I, I, I mean, there's tons of communities out there built around, uh, like, I'm a member and I've been a member of some uh, fishing. That's one of my hobbies that I really love. I really love spear fishing. And so what's great is that when you connect with those communities, and this is advice we can give to our listeners, but... You know, your stories are very rich. They're there. They just need to be told. Yeah. Right? And they need to be told at scale because people aren't able to travel to these places any longer. Right? So yeah. there's the innovation opportunity exists. And when you when you can tell those stories and you can build that community, commerce can just happen. I think so. You know, because, like, as I get, as I get more expert in any of the communities I'm a member of, because I want to, I enjoy it. It's a release from the day to day grind and everything else, and it's it's something great to, you know, passion to kind of follow. It's I'm going to s- step up, and I'm going to want you know more variety. I'm going to more more quality and things like that. And I think what you're doing right here is is really cool with your club. Well, I appreciate it. I I I think it's what people need and want, mm-hmm. and I hope it is. And I love taking people on a journey anyway. You know, whether you come or not, I don't care. But let's let's go on this journey. <laughs> and, and, and I see all the other wine yeah. clubs out there, and you know they're pushing things. You know, you get fifteen bottles for eighty bucks or something, and oh, I need to buy them. And yeah, it's that's not. Again, you could probably go and get the secondary discount at Tom Thumb and do the same thing. But you know, I just I, I think it's really cool to open your your palate up to the world of wine and man you know when wine pairs the right way with food and 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 you know what john ash the father of wine country cuisine who was taught at this culinary institute who was um the famous um julia child's partner sure you know what he said which i love they go like when julia and he cook they have a glass of the wine they want to drink that night and while they're cooking, they're sipping, and they bring the food 
oh. to taste what they want to pair with that wine. It's like docking the space shuttle. Yeah, it's like docking. <laughs> it's exactly. It's it. like you have to align it. Yeah, because you're always told, oh, fish, right. you better have a white wine. Yeah, you know, exactly. Oh, steak, you better have a big red. Yeah, you know, blew my wife's mind, man. I, I went out. We were celebrating uh, during shelter in place, and I got this gorgeous fillets, and we cooked them up. She says, what are you going to serve with it? And I pulled out this bottle of handwritten Chardonnay. She goes, what? And I go, you know, we've been at Ruth Chris, yeah. where they serve the steak with butter. Yeah. I go, this has got a lot of oak on it. It's got this beautiful velvety butter finish. And Sounds we had this uh, Chardonnay <clears throat> with this big filet, and it was just perfect. You know. Well, I think I think that's a point that that you know you're talking about unique selling propositions earlier. I think I think that's your difference. You're trying through your club. You're trying to educate and make your members a more informed consumer, uh-huh. and and by doing that, you're actually lowering their risk. Oh, it's, hun- it's, yeah. You're making every purchase of wine they ever make for the rest of their lives less risky because you've taught them more about what goes into it. So they might do something crazy like pair a Chardonnay with a right, filet, right? Right. They're not scared. They're not, not scared. scared at all. And we did a deal. Meredith and I did a hangout on LinkedIn with a 150 um, HR directors. Mm-hmm. And we did HR versus, uh, with wine. And there was just, and our, our assignment was show up for the hangout with a bottle of wine that you didn't think you'd like. So I picked, you know, the. I have a little bit of an issue with real sweet wine. So Moscato is one of the sweetest. Sure. Unfortunately, a good Moscato is still really, really good. And so I poured a Moscato and, and you know, we went through it. And once, you know, I described the notes and, and the stories behind Moscato and whatever wines they were drinking, they kind of started going, oh, I kind of, just like this. A lot of people didn't like a Verstemeter. Yeah. A lot of people don't like that petrol oil in a Viognier. But, you know, you, you have this fun blend, and they get a little try a little bit, and they can go into each one of the four things, and they're having a ball with it. And And we ended up seeing so many things. How many times do you have people in your in your workforce that you just don't like, but the more you know about them and the more Never happens. You, you see their quality, you know, you start <laughs> liking them. And, yeah, you know, so true. they're going to go back and do some wine drinking team building uh, games after that. That's awesome. It worked yeah. great. Well, that's great. Well, that seems like a perfect fit for an HR department. Yeah. You know, yeah. they're dealing with people every single day. And why, why, what's better than working with a tool that creates community? Right. Right. And real refreshing and kind of makes you feel good at the end of the day. Well, Lou, thank you for joining us on our podcast today. I have a ton of respect for what you've accomplished in your career and super excited for you with your latest venture. And you're obviously prepared for it. I think so. Yeah, I really feel like I am. Cheers, man. Cheers, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming in. Having me on. So if, if somebody wants to follow your podcast, where do they find it? We're on all the platforms, Major Crush. Um, most of them were the first one you'll see if on a Spotify or uh, Apple. And, and um, so it's pretty easy, pretty easy. And we'd love for you to come on and like and subscribe. That would be great. That's great. And build and, a community. And like we were saying, it's, it seems like if you do that, your future gatherings will be much more enjoyable because I, the yeah, wine will be better no matter where you get it. And I will warn yeah. you, if you listen to the last one, when we interviewed the ambassador from Italy on Italian wines, if you will, it's, I'm warning you, when you're done listening to it, you will have to eat Italian. Oh, it, it's, it was so good. We cooked the biggest bowl of pasta that night. That sounds delicious. Well, thank you again, Lou, and I really appreciate your time on our show today. Thank you, buddy.